there are two levels of forgiveness. The first level is the forgiveness that we receive from the Lord. That's the kind of forgiveness we talked with you about last week. The forgiveness that is offered to us by the Lord. The Lord is so great and the Lord is so loving and the Lord is so merciful that he comes into our lives and he assures us that he's able to forgive us. He is able to receive us the same way as the father was waiting for his son, the son who ran away, the son who didn't deserve that forgiveness, the son who was mean to his father, but his father was still ready to greet him, actually to run when he noticed him coming home, and to welcome him into his family as nothing had ever happened before. That's the the first level of forgiveness. That's the forgiveness that we want to have. That's the kind of forgiveness that we are happy about. But then there is that second level of forgiveness that I want to bring to your attention today. That's the forgiveness that we expect to give to the other people around us. But that's the hard one. And I'm sure you'll agree with me today. That's the hard kind of forgiveness. And that's the kind of a sermon that you want someone else to hear, right? Let's agree with that. And you are saying, I wish my husband was here today. He needed to hear that today. Or my mother. My mother had to be here today because she never learned how to forgive or maybe an elder of the church, or a deacon who were not nice to you, who needs to hear that sermon. That's usually the kind of a sermon that we regret that someone else is not in the church this morning. Because we are saying, that's the sermon and the message they need to hear. And we stumble ourselves on that second level or the second kind of forgiveness that is expected of us. But then you're saying, I know, Pastor Peter, you may be joking about all of that, but unfortunately, you do not know how that person treated me. If only you knew the way I was treated, you would never, ever expect me to forgive that person. And you probably, probably somewhere deep inside of your head or your heart are thinking that way right now. Just pause for a second. And you'll agree with me, that's what you are thinking. Some of us sitting in this church this morning thinking, if only Pastor Peter knew how my father treated me. If only Pastor Peter knew how my husband treats me at home. If only someone knew how my neighbor treated me, then he would never, ever expect me to forgive that person. And I agree. I don't know the way you are hurting today. I have no idea. I don't know all the pain that you endured from that person. I cannot even imagine how painful it may be for you today as you came to this church. You tried to suppress that pain. You tried to suppress that hurt, but it's still there as I am bringing it up, as I'm digging deeper into your life and your soul. You know that pain, right? Let's agree. You know it's hurting. It hurts right now as you are thinking about it. I don't know the pain, but I may assure you, the Lord knows that pain. And if the Lord knows, if the Lord knows that pain, I may assure you, He can give you all the strength in the world and all the power and all the resources of the universe to actually, actually forgive that person. And I am very concerned about that sin. And I want to call it a sin. Unforgiveness is a sin. It is a sin. 
Because having that spirit of unforgiveness in our heart, we lose the eternity. We lose the eternity. You heard the scripture reading, and I don't want right now to read the whole parable that Jesus presented to those that were around him. But in Matthew chapter 18, verse 35, verse 35, pay attention. Matthew 13, verse 35 says, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart, what is he saying? Does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And I'm sure when Jesus was saying his brother, he was also thinking his sister. And I'm sure he was thinking his father. And I'm sure he was saying his mother. And he was saying his wife. And he was saying his husband. And his elder. And his deacon. And his church member. And his pastor. Everyone all together. Everyone included. Jesus said, if you do not forgive them their sins, what happens to you? My heavenly father will do the same to you. You cannot be in the kingdom of God if you have a sin in your life. If you have the spirit of unforgiveness, you cannot be in the heavenly kingdom. That's horrible to hear, right? You may be asking, Pastor Peter, are you sure? Are you sure it's that serious? Maybe, maybe you are not quite right, but this is not my sermon that I'm preaching to you today. I'm reading to you the words of Jesus. He forgave us. He, he has given us his forgiveness. He died on the cross so that he would be able to forgive me and you. And now he's saying, if I was able to forgive you for everything you've done to me, I expect the same thing from you. And if you do not forgive someone, if you still, still have that unforgiveness in your heart, be sure the doors of heaven are closed for you. And I'm sorry for being so straightforward today. I'm very sorry, but I want, I want you to be in the heavenly kingdom. And that's the way the Lord wants of each one of us. He wants each one of us to be in his kingdom. But he says, I'm so, so sorry, he says. If you have that spirit of unforgiveness towards someone who was mean to you, towards someone who was horrible to you, towards someone who never came and never said, please forgive me. If you haven't forgiven that person, unfortunately, you cannot be in my kingdom. And that's the reason that unforgiveness is more subtle than most of the sins. It just comes so softly. It comes so quietly into our lives. And it just lodges somewhere, somewhere deep behind. And then gradually it's growing. And, and we may try to suppress it and to run away from it and to hide it. But it's, it's there and it's like cancer that is eating up our heart. But also, I'm concerned about that sin because it is more common than all the other sins. You may not be stealing from someone. You may not be cheating on your spouse but it is somewhere there, deep inside of our lives. It is a very common sin. But also, I think because, because it is more dangerous than many other sins. It may not bring overdose in my life. It may not lead me to a car accident. But unfortunately, I should say that it brings more damage to this world and to our lives, and to our churches than any other sins. The spirit of unforgiveness divides our families, brings divorce into our lives, destroys our lives, destroys the lives of our children, divides churches, divides the community, 
destroys the society, and most of all, deprives us of the kingdom of God. And that's why Jesus is so concerned about that sin and so concerned about that state of mind that we may have. That's why he sees it on a completely different level than we see. We see everything from our how much perspective. When it comes to our tithing and offerings, that's usually the question we are asking, how much? But the Lord says, you all belong to me. Your, your whole life belongs to me. Then when it comes to forgiveness, again, Peter approaches Jesus here in Matthew chapter 18. And what's the question that he's asking here? How much, he says, how often, Lord, how many times we are trying to calculate our salvation. And Peter was hoping that he was right there at the doors of heaven. Jesus was right next to him. Jesus is the Son of God. He is, the, he is he's God himself right next to him. So the kingdom of God is, is almost there. He is almost ready to step in into the kingdom of God. Just the last little thing. He needs to be sure how many times to forgive his friend or his brother or his enemy. And he is already in the kingdom of God. Then. But the Lord says... You are, you are looking from a different perspective. That's not the way my kingdom works. My kingdom is not about the check marks of how many times you were able to forgive someone. Jesus says, the numbers does not work in my kingdom. It's not about the numbers. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. It's about the way... You give yourself to the Lord. You give your mind, your heart. You give everything you have to the Lord and to those children of God that are around you. And your wife is a child of God. And your children, your daughter, your son, they are the children of God also. You need to learn how to forgive them. Amen. And, and your, your neighbor and your church member, and your deacon, and your pastor, and that woman in the church you hated, they are a child of God also. And Jesus says it's not about how many times. And it's not about how many times she asked to be forgiven. It's about the way you relate to that person as the daughter of God and as the son of God. And Jesus says, you need to understand, that's how it works in my kingdom. There are two levels, again, he says. There is that man who owed millions of dollars to his boss. Millions of dollars, I have no idea. That's, he says, one level, when we realize we owe everything to the Lord. And there is that second level of our forgiveness of the other people around us. That's the way Jesus says, my kingdom works. I have no idea how that man managed, managed to owe that much money to the king or to his employer. I have no idea. It seems almost impossible. But then I think about my heavenly father, and I think that my heavenly father opened that generous line of credit for me. A very generous line of credit he opened for all of us. He created this beautiful planet for us. And he said, it's yours. Take it. Use it. Use it as much as you need to use it. And then he said, I love you so much, I'll be sending rain, and I'll be sending the sunshine into your life, and I'll be giving you health, and I'll be giving you your family, and I will give you my son, he said, and I will give you the most precious thing that I have, I'll give you my son who will die for you on the cross. That's the line of credit. That's the most generous line of credit that you can think about. You can get millions of dollars in your line of credit if you know the right people and have good credit history here. But the Lord opened the most generous line of credit for us, and we owe everything to Him. And then at a certain point, we turn away and we walk away. And we hope it works the way it works here in this world. We close or we, we just foreclose on that line of credit. 
or, or maybe we file for bankruptcy. That's not the way it works in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, he says, there is no other way except, except as he explains here in this parable here. He says, you owe me all that money. All that money. You cannot pay me all of that. And now, therefore, you need to be, you need to be in prison. You need to be in jail. Verse 25. But his, he was not able to pay. Verse 25 of chapter 18. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that the payment be made. There is no other way except, except the death, the eternal destruction that is awaiting us because of our bankruptcy. But then I see the man is pleading, is pleading and saying in, in verse 26, and I think he's not understanding something. Let's look briefly at verse 26. The servant, therefore, fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. And what is he saying? Here it is on the screen. And I, let's read it together. And I will pay thee all. That's, that's where the problem is. He thought that he can pay it back. That's where our problem is also so often. We try to carry that burden also. And we are hoping we'll somehow manage to go through it. If our mortgage on our house is for 30 years and, and we are struggling with that mortgage and we are carrying that burden, we are doing whatever in our power every month to pay that mortgage. The debt that we have on that generous line of credit that the Lord opened for us, believe me, it's more than for 30 years. It's for the whole eternity. You may do whatever you want. You may try as much as you want. You may try really hard. But until you realize there is nothing you can do to pay off that line of credit. Until that time, be assured, there is nothing else is awaiting us as to be sold and to lose our families and to lose whatever we have to eternal destruction until we realize we need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, I tried. I tried hard, but now, Lord, just take me, take everything that I have. Take me and just give me your forgiveness and give me your compassion. It only, it's only at that point we become free from the debt that we have and that we owe. But there is the second part to that story. And the second part is that man who was hoping he can do something about the debt who was hoping he can repay, receiving still the forgiveness from the king, goes, he finds someone who owes him very little money. Very little money, just a few dollars, because he owed thousands of, dinar, uh, thousands of talents. Now that man owes him just a, just a few hundreds of, just a few hundred dollars, or maybe even less than that. But he is so selfish. And he didn't understand the depths of the forgiveness that he received from the king. And now he's choking that man from the selfish reasons. Not because he was desperate. He just received the forgiveness. He just became a free person. But now he's choking that person because he didn't realize what forgiveness is all about. And I think until each one of us realizes and understands what God's forgiveness towards us is all about, we'll never be able to forgive someone else in our lives. We'll not be able until, until we are still talking to the Lord and saying, God, just be patient with me. I'll get better tomorrow. Lord, be patient with me. I'll fix that problem. I'll, I'll get better. I'll pay you more, Lord. Every day and every year I'll be paying you more. Until that, until we are talking that way with the Lord on that level, I assure you, my friends, we'll not be able to forgive anyone around us or in the church or in the family or in the community. We'll still be choking, choking to death those people that are around us. We'll be throwing them into jail, hoping that we'll finally get repaid 
Because we never realized ourselves what's God, what God's forgiveness is all about. But the Lord is teaching us. I want you to read with me several passages from the scripture. And I hope that our audiovisual team will help us. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 to help us understand the importance of that forgiveness that is expected of us. Colossians, if you don't see it on the screen, open it in your Bibles. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. You can read it from your Bibles or here on the screen. Let's read it together. Forbearing one another and... Forgiving one another, if anyone have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so so, so also do you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. I want you to hear that and read it with me together. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Luke chapter 11, verse 4. I want us to read it together. And forgive us our sins, for we also do what? Forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will do what? will also forgive you. And let's read verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father will forgive you. Jesus Christ is teaching us this important lesson of forgiveness. Why? Because forgiveness, I want you to remember, forgiveness brings freedom. Forgiveness brings freedom. The man from the parable we just read about, he was forgiven, and when he was forgiven, he received freedom. He became a free person. He enjoyed that freedom so much. The Lord is waiting for us to realize what forgiveness is all about. So many of us are afraid to come to the Lord and ask for that forgiveness, and until we do that, we are not free. We are not free from our sins. We are not free from our burdens. We are not free from the guilt that we are carrying. It's still sitting inside of us. And we are slaves. We are still the prisoners. We still carry it. I want all of us to experience that forgiveness. Maybe not in the way I heard about the lady who, who joined the church. And he was all carried away with the great music and the praise songs that she loved so much. And she made... A confession, the testimony. One morning in her church, she said, Before I joined your church and started singing those wonderful hymns that you are singing, I hated my uncle so much that I actually, I vowed that I would never even go to his funeral. But since the time I joined your church, I'm so changed. She said, she said I can even go to his funeral today if needed, she said. That's, that's not the kind of forgiveness that the Lord is expecting. That's not the kind of freedom that the Lord wants us to find when we are free. We don't want anyone to be dead. We are not finding joy in attending anybody's funeral. We want people to be alive around us because we found freedom. We found forgiveness from the Lord. We want to grant that forgiveness to someone else around us. Remember, forgiveness brings freedom to you. Forgiveness brings healing to you. That man, the man who owed all those millions of dollars, he was a sick person. I'm sure he was under stress. I'm sure he couldn't sleep all that well. I'm sure he couldn't forget even for a minute all the money that he owed to the king. He was eaten alive, but being forgiven, he finds that healing that he needed so much. It's not that he forgot what he received from his king. It's not that he had forgotten about the debt that he had to the king. But now the door is closed. Forgiveness brings that healing and that closure that we need so much. That we need so much on those problems of unforgiving spirit that we carried for years and years. Let me share with you 
one story that happened in my life as I was traveling and preaching in one of the countries of Eastern Europe. I was approached by a lady who asked to pray for her husband, and she said, my husband has cancer, and his cancer is really bad. I don't know how long he has to live. It was during one of my meetings. But she said, please pray for him. And I usually pray. There is usually dozens and dozens of people after the sermon, those who want a special prayer to be said for their children, their family. And Galina, who travels with me often, she knows all those people who are so sincere and so, so passionate about the prayer, and they want the pastor to pray for their family member. And, and I prayed with that woman, and I prayed for her husband, and I I was very sincere as I was praying. I was praying for God's will to be done in his life. And if healing is God's will, so that the healing would be granted. And it was at the beginning of our series of meetings. And then closer to the end, I received a phone call from that woman. And she called and she said, uh, I, I, want to, I want to say something to you, Pastor. You, I'm that woman the, who asked to pray for her husband. Uh, and uh, you probably have so many, you don't remember everyone. But uh, my husband had cancer, she said. And when I heard had cancer, I started thinking, if he had cancer, he's probably okay. He's probably doing all right now. And I was almost ready to say, praise the Lord. And she said, uh, he had cancer, but now I want you to know he passed away. And uh, I felt a little embarrassed and I thought I prayed and uh, I, I was hoping the, the outcome would be better but she said pastor after a long pause when I, I didn't know what to say we prayed and, and, now, and now he passed away but she said I want you to know pastor that after that prayer when we came home and I came with my family he was a different person for the last several days of his life before, he couldn't forgive the Lord. He was so angry at the Lord. He was so angry at, at, at God's will that, that he had cancer, that he hated God. And he, he hated everyone and us because we were praying right next to his bed. He hated us for that. He didn't want to hear our prayers. And he hated his grandchildren because they were coming with me to, to, to your meetings and to your church. He didn't want to see us. That's how much he hated his condition. That's how he, he hated God. That's how he hated the, the, just the concept of praying about someone. But now for the last few days after that prayer, I don't know what happened. But obviously she said, the Lord touched his life. He was able to forgive God and, and he asked to pray for him every day. And he became so peaceful and he was all nice to all of us. I want to thank you, Pastor, for that prayer. My husband passed away, but he found healing in that prayer. 